family. Thank you, family. God is so incredibly good. Amen. All the time, God is good. It is always good to be home. As we talk about home and belonging today, I um, am usually giving thanks and praise uh, for my beloved while he's back home with the babies, but I'm glad that he is in the, in the place today. So baby, I am thankful for you. And for all the faces that I haven't seen in a very long time, thank you for showing up today and for being in the number as you have come home to worship. We're not gonna belabor the point um, as we talk for a moment about coming home where you belong. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, we give you thanks and praise. And for the many things that we've held just this morning alone, we ask Almighty God, by the power of your spirit, that you will center down in us and silence any voice within us but your own. God, I pray that you take my tongue hostage, that what I speak will be what you want us as your people to hear. God, I pray now in Jesus' name that it will land in the hearts of all of us, both individually and collectively as your body, in the ways that are necessary, God, for us to transcend, for us to heal, for us to become, for us to be. May it be so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're looking today at um, a lectionary text. So for those of you who may not know, the lectionary is um, a calendar, a liturgical calendar that lays out scripture, usually in three year rotations where you work through most of the Bible. And so every Sunday and then every week of the year, based upon the different um, worship seasons of the year, there are scriptures that are assigned. And this scripture shows up in this week's lectionary text. It is the book of Ephesians. Now, the book of Ephesians is written by Paul, and he is writing this book while he is imprisoned, okay? And he is writing it in a way that has a very um, consistent theme throughout around unity because he is talking to the church at Ephesus or those who are believers in Ephesus because there is disunity in their community because some Christians are Jewish Christians, they have a Jewish background, and some Christians are Gentiles, a non-Jewish background. So this is the context in which this particular prayer blessing is read and um, written for the people. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now let's pause. We can say father and mother here because in the Greek, the word for God in the New Testament is theos, and theos is both a noun in the feminine and the masculine. So for this reason, I bow my knees before the father and mother from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its home. I pray that according to the riches of God's glory, that God may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through God's spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to be fully able to comprehend with all the saints or all the holy ones what is the breadth, the length, the height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So to, for just a few moments, I want us to look at just a couple of things that I believe this text kind of gives to us around what it means to belong to God, what it means to belong to God. And the first thing is to belong to God is to be abundant. To belong to God is to be abundant. One of my very good friends, uh, Vince Bayon, once said to a group of students in, um, at Shaw University, which is the oldest HBCU in the South, 
He says, I want to caution you to resist or to reject this idea of black people in particular being like crabs in a bucket, pulling each other down while we try to rise to the top. He says, and this is why I caution you in this. He says, I caution you because the bucket is not the natural habitat of the crab. He says, so when we are confined and bound in an unnatural habitat, we respond in kind, in unnatural ways. And so what it creates then is um, kind of this semblance of homesickness. And what does homesickness give to us? It gives to us anxiety. It gives us fear. It gives us panic. It takes us from ourselves. It makes us feel like we are far away from who we are. Therefore, to belong, to come home to where we belong is to come back to ourselves. So the first culture of belonging is within us. And the first way in which we learn that to belong to God is to be abundant. Now, some of you may remember Sesame Street growing up. Hey. hey. Yeah, I remember Sesame Street. And if you remember Sesame Street, you remember that there were several um, segments. You know, Sesame Street go in segments. There were several segments that was the, were designed to teach children about difference. And those segments had a song. And that song says, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things doesn't belong. Can you tell which thing is not like the other by the time I finish this song. And then at the end of the song, whichever item was different would be removed. It would be taken from the center view of the frame of the, car of the camera. Now, this did effectively teach young people and children what it meant to tell the difference between things. But what it also inadvertently taught us was that to be different was to not belong. And so from a very early age, we are shaped and conditioned to believe that different is deficient in some kind of way. Yeah? Now, the problem with different automatically being seen as different is that we then begin to believe that if someone or something is different from whatever we consider the norm as if norms exist, right, then it is justified for that thing or that person to be confined, to be bound, to be kept from what we were created to be, which was to belong and to be in community. But one of the things that we don't often name about scarcity narratives is that when we live and believe a scarcity narrative, we are in essence making a claim about God. We are in essence saying that God is so cruel that God chose to create some people to have more than enough and others to never have enough. It is to make an indictment on the character of God. Now, in contrast, our passage of scripture today has a lot of language of abundance. We hear breath. We hear depth. We hear field. We hear fullness. These are words of abundance. Now, abundance is not to be confused at all with overindulgence. Overindulgence is um, this excessive self-gratification, often to the point of causing harm. It is also not to be confused with prosperity. Prosperity means um, to achieve, particularly in uh, material ways or financial ways. Now, there is nothing wrong with achieving things materially or to have financial gain. There's nothing wrong in and of itself. But when that is our core, our center, our goal, what that becomes is capitalism. And what we end up doing is gaining the whole world just to lose our soul. Now, the definition of abundance is very different. What is abundance? Abundance is a state of never being in lack. 
And it is so complete that it cannot be diminished. So complete that it cannot be diminished. And so then, if God and God's love, based upon this passage, is the source of our abundance, how can that ever be diminished? That our work in the belonging of abundance is to be able to trust God's love enough that we are always able to tap it in any moment, in any situation, in any dynamic that may be around us and that we are experiencing. Now, when we look at this text, though, this word breath, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breath? Breath here means with, okay? And it is, it is like um, this like extensive extent, okay? But this, this word breath also means the opposite of terms like ends of the earth or corners of the earth. And this is why. The reason it is the opposite of a term like ends of the earth is because what we know is that technically, technically, scientists say that there is no clear delineation between where Earth's atmosphere ends and outer space begins. In fact, Scientists have drawn a line in order to create a delineation. They call that line the Carmen line. And so when you pass by the Carmen line, you are in outer space. But the only reason they make that delineation there is because 99.99997% of the Earth's atmosphere exists below that. So when you pass by that line, the atmosphere of the Earth still exists beyond it. But that is the line that they choose to distinguish between something that is indistinguishable. So I want you all to hear this. I want you to hear this. I want you to be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breath, the expansiveness to be abundant. To be abundant is to take up space. It is to constantly be expanding. And it is to live in such a way that you understand that your expansiveness and the way that you grow and the way that you expand in no way takes away from the expanding of someone else because God's love is so abundant that God doesn't have to stop loving me in order to love you. Do you have to stop loving one kid? To love another? Do you have to love one sister or this brother? No, you got love enough for all of it. So how much more love does God have? Our God is expansive and God creates in expansion. Now, the Christian mystic Barbara Holmes coins this term or uses this term in her book, Race in the Cosmos, called omnicentricity. And she says this, she says, in the cosmos, there are no margins. There are only ever expanding centers. And she says, this is why she believes that God never intended for any of us to be marginalized. I want you all to hear this. In order to belong to God, you have to be abundant. That means that all of a sudden there's more than enough room for me, for my beauty, for my brilliance, no matter how different I may seem. That means that there's more than enough room for my shortcomings because grace is not limited. It is very abundant. That means there is more than enough room for me to expand and to evolve because my worth and my value is not based upon being compared to somebody else. There's room enough for all of us. To belong to God is to be abundant. But to belong to God is also to always be home. It is to always be home. For everything in heaven and in earth takes its name from God. 
And we are reminded here of other scriptures that many of us have heard. The heavens what? Declare your glory. Or the earth is what? The Lord's and the fullness thereof. Elder and uh, the late elder, black feminist, Bell Hooks, in her book, Belonging, talked about her grandfather. And she said that her grandfather um, was a man who lived through the um, evils of Jim Crow. And she said that despite what he experienced living through Jim Crow, he was able to find a culture of belonging amid nature. He said, or she recalled him saying to her, that if people are able to find and relate properly to their place in nature, then everything will be all right. He says, but if they begin to think they are God, that's when trouble comes. It is this idea that the earth bears witness. We belong in all of creation. That it isn't just this idea that because I live in Berkeley or because I live in Oakland or because I live in Raleigh, that if I travel anywhere else on this earth that I don't belong. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in heaven and in earth takes its name from who? God. And who's do I, who do I belong to? God. So there is this sense that belonging... Belonging is about this strong connection to all of creation. It is a connection to the land. It is a connection to nature. And yes, it is a connection to people. And so even when we enter into communities that seek to really harness and live out belonging in a healthy way, like here at The Way, right? That this idea is that we are really just reflections or mirrors of the belonging that is at our core. Our belonging both to nature and to God. And this is what Bell Hooks says. She says, belonging is a reciprocal connection to the land, to nature, to all creation. It is generosity and egalitarianism. It is a mutual affinity for alternative modes of knowing, inclusiveness, nonviolent resolution, and openness to spirit. Now, what we have to remember is that even in the communities that do it the best, sometimes we're going to get it wrong. And the reason we're going to get it wrong is because communities are made up of us. And every single one of us are still seeking and trying, searching for the ways in which we can find our grounding, our being in the love of God. And that takes us to really what's at the core here. So in her book, um, The Dispossessed, I'm a big sci-fi fantasy fan, and so... In her book, Dispossessed, Ursula Le Guin says this, or one of her characters says this, you can always go home as long as you understand that home is a place you've never been. Now, Bell Hooks, in this book, Belonging, continues to expand. I think they're connecting, in, there's connections between these two thoughts. And that is, she talks about growing up in rural Kentucky mountains and never really feeling at home. And when she left, she actually felt like she was kind of exiled. And she recalls coming back as an adult and feeling like there was less space for her there as an adult than there was for her as a child, that this home that was supposed to be a place where she belonged, not only did she not belong as a child, but somehow between the time that she left and came back, it got, it changed and it became less a place of belonging. She says, and this is what kind of led her to realize that to fully belong anywhere, one must be able to understand the ground of their being. The ground of their being. Paul says this. He says, I want you to be able to have the strength in your inner being that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, that you may be able to comprehend what is the breadth 
and the length and the height and the depth that you may be what? Grounded in the love of God. Dwell. That Christ may dwell in our hearts, y'all. Dwell is more than inhabit. Dwell is to be exactly home. So I want you to hear it. That God, Jesus, would take up habitation in the effectual core of your being and be exactly at home in that place. Can you hear it? Be exactly at home in that place. Now, y'all, I am, I'm, I'm an alumnus of North Carolina A&T State University, so all y'all wearing these blue and gold, that's, those are our colors. Now, you know, Pastor T told us yesterday, you know, my husband's an eagle. Aggies and eagles are, like, rivals. And so, you know, Y'all, we rivals, but you know, it's sibling rivalry. We all come out of shawl. I see the blue and gold shirt. I'd be like, Aggies. They're my Aggies, right? Did you see the blue and gold shirt and they like warriors? <laughs> Ain't no Aggie gonna see blue and gold and not see blue and gold first. You know why? Because we are known to have the greatest homecoming on earth. It's called Jiho. Greatest homecoming on on earth and y'all I don't care where I go in I don't care where I go everywhere I've gone if I see an Aggie shirt if I hear that somebody is an Aggie there are certain call and response phrases that I can give and they gonna know what I'm saying I can say Aggie and I'll hear pride I can say Aggie born they'll be say Aggie bread and when I die I'll be Aggie dead I don't have to know them. I may have never met them, never see them, and won't see them ever again. And we can be so far from the campus of North Carolina A&T, it doesn't matter. You know why? Because A&T is in us. And that is the point. We make our home in God, and God chooses to make God's home in us. This means that everywhere you go, you are home. And when you are home, you belong. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. And now this, that Christ may dwell in your hearts, that Christ may be perfectly at home in you. Now, y'all, I'm, I'm wrestling with this sermon right now. I'll tell you. I'll tell anybody. I've been preaching for 20 plus years, over two decades, and it don't get easy. It actually gets harder, right? And that's all right because God always does what God does. That's right, brother. It's all right. But as I'm wrestling with this and God is wrestling in me, I come to realize that this all sounds real good and real purdy. But it is real hard to actually access this feeling and this experience of being at home at all times. And as I was wrestling, I said, okay, what am I missing? And what came up for me was my favorite meditation by Howard Thurman, one that I've shared in this space before. It's called Inward Sea. He says this. He says, in every person, there is an inward sea. And in that sea, there is an island. And on that island, there is an altar. And standing guard before that altar is the angel with the flaming sword. Nothing can get past that angel with the flaming sword to be placed on your altar unless it has the mark of your inner 
authority. Nothing can get past the angel with the flaming sword unless it has or is a part of the fluid area of your consent. This is our crucial link with the eternal. Paul says this, my prayer is that you will be strengthened in your inner being, the power of God. Yeah? yeah? That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints. Power here isn't just to achieve. Power here means the ability to achieve by applying the inherent abilities of God. It means inherent power. It means power that is endued. It means power that is in you by virtue of your nature. This is what we need in order to be sanctified. This is the kind of power all living things need to be who and what we were created to be free. But there's more because as Howard Thurman says, we all have this island and we all have this altar. What you can hear or I hope you can hear is that God has given us command over this altar. There are very few things that we are in control of. This inner life is one of them. So we have command over this altar. But this language that he uses to be able to comprehend, we should not take this lightly. This language in literally means aggressive strength. It means to seize, to lay hold of. It means possession. Okay? We are talking about Paul praying a prayer that says not only do I pray that you get this, but I pray that you will fight for this. I pray that you will aggressively and possessively fight to embody the abundant love of Jesus. Has anybody here ever seen a toddler get something taken from them that they believed was theirs? The way they fight, we've got to fight. It is important to remember that Paul is in this context. Paul is imprisoned. Paul is seeking to encourage the people around the vision. Paul is saying, I need you to fight to cling and to embody, to possessively own this, that God has given us ownership over the truth of who we are. He says, and I need you to own it, even in harsh and hostile environments. What good? What good is it if the crab makes it out the bucket? If when they get to the sea, they're afraid to go in. Or they're scared to scurry across the sand. What good is it if we cannot access it? We have got to know that just because people or others may say it ain't so, don't make it so. A denial of what is does not mean that what is ceases to be. A biological parent can deny their child, but you know what? DNA ain't going to lie. Deny all you want to. But what denial will do if we let it is keep us from accessing what is. We are to possessively and if necessary, aggressively seize the love of God within. We are good at locating where other places external of us are lacking in belonging lacking in home. We are good at saying, this ain't home for me. Are we as good at locating when that's happening within? When we are not at home with God in ourselves, that we are to fight just as hard internally as we do externally to get what God has already said is ours.
For everything in heaven and on earth takes its name from God. God owns all of this. And this means that no matter where you find yourself, whether you're high or whether you're low, whether you're being affirmed or rejected, whether you are being persecuted or loved on, that no matter where you are, I want you to hear the call of the one whose love is abundantly intrinsic. I want you to hear the call of the one whose imagination becomes reality. I want you to hear the call of the one who creates expansively and who is expansive. I want you to hear the call of the one who renders impossibility obsolete. I want you to hear the call of the one who is abundant provision. I want you to hear the call to come home where you belong. Now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.